Dr. Sushil this side, your orthopedic faculty at DBMCI and today I am going to discuss the most important topics from orthopedics which have got like high potential of being asked in your any of the exam focusing basically on your NEET or NEXT of the 2023 exam, right? So I will be focusing out, pointing out the topics, uh, you must know the details of which which have been frequently asked in last 2-3 to three years of your exam INI or the NEET and let's see how the line which have been changed in subsequent years questions. Okay, so starting with the 10 most important topics, I'm taking them as the 10 most important topics. Okay, the first one I'm taking up is a codfish spine appearance like this. Okay, so you all know the topic that I want to highlight here along with this particular image is basically osteoporosis. So you all know that for osteoporosis and scoliosis, these have been two frequently asked topics in any of your exam in the past years. So osteoporosis basically, you know, the patient most commonly have the affected areas as like vertebra, the neck of femur and when you talk about the upper limb, it is usually the distal radius which is affected. When you talk about distal radius, you know, the most commonest fracture that is associated in distal radius, it is actually Coley's injury, okay. So when the patient has got these areas, the most common presentation that we usually see in any of the patient is pain and we know that this pain can be like a traumatic pain without a trauma the patient is having a pain for last long time or it can be a traumatic pain so a traumatic or traumatic injuries a traumatic pain means without trauma so if you observe a traumatic changes in the spine in an old age lady usually will be a diffuse kind of change which is present all through the vertebras which is present all through the vertebras right and you can see the intervertebral areas are showing you this kind of picture which is known as what that is known as this kind of fish that you can see in the background right that is known as atraumatic patients will be coming to you but this picture which is known as the codfish spine appearance that is known as the codfish spine appearance traumatic ones whenever there is a traumatic kind of injury you know traumatic ones will be coming to you with a compression fracture of the vertebra with a compression fracture of vertebra so compression fracture of vertebra will be traumatic kind of change and codfish spine appearance will be a traumatic kind of change isn't it so now you know that if you want to actually diagnose a patient of osteoporosis what is the ideal way what is a gold standard way to diagnose a patient of osteoporosis so the diagnosis will be made by first of all the point here the concept should be clear that serum mineralization is supposed to be normal and if you're talking about the diagnosis finally the gold standard one we know it will be dexa scan so that will be dual energy x-ray absorptiometry dual energy x-ray absorptiometry and what we do here the more bone mineral density is measured in the terms of t-score so whenever the t-score is better than minus one we call it like a normal bone whenever the score is between like minus one to minus 2.5 it is known as osteopenia and when the score falls below 2.5 is what you call as osteo definitive osteoporosis the score getting below the 2.5 standard deviation as compared to a normal person okay and as a part of treatment process you should know this dexa you know it is recommended in every lady in routine after 65 years of age so this is recommended for every female above 65 when you plan about the treatment plan you know when you plan about the treatment part of this disorder we must know that the treatment has to be you have to be focused on both the parameters together that means you have to give a treatment which will inhibit the resorption of the bone you have to give a treatment plan which will inhibit the resorption of the bone as well as the one which promote the formation of the bone inhibit the resorption and promoting the formation so inhibit resorption and promoting the formation so drugs which inhibit the resorption are what drugs the drugs which inhibit resorption are number one number one bisphosphonates bisphosphonates second are the calcitonin nasal spray these na these are nasal sprays basically number three is estrogen and number four is selective estrogen receptor modulator right these are the drugs which inhibit the further resorption of the bone the drugs on the other hand which promote the formation of the bone the most important one we know is teriparatide so what exactly is that teriparatide? You know teriparatide is a synthetic parathyroid hormone. It is a synthetic parathyroid hormone. Then we have our favorite drug of all the time calcium 
and for its absorption what is required is calcitriol. So teriparatide, the calci, calcium and the calcitriol these are three promoting formation. So always the combo therapy has to be given. Other drugs which are also to be read and known here they are number one is denosumab. You all know that denosumab is basically done doing what? It blocks the rank ligands and we know rank ligands are associated with what? They are associated with activation of the osteoclast and then we have a drug which has got a dual action which is known as strontium renylate which is known as strontium renylate. So strontium renylate basically you know it has got a dual action. It has got a dual action. So denosumab strontium renylate. So this is the you know basic uh, questionnaire around the osteoporosis topic. Okay. So we must know osteoporosis has been repeated a number of times in the last couple of years. Every word this is something like this patient is a commonest patient which you will see like in every household not in the OPDs even at our household usually our grandmother the old lady of the house is usually osteoporotic post menopausal. We know that right. So this is a common problem. Let's see the next ones. Let's see the next one we have. I put this deformity based question. So guys you all know the importance of deformity. So when you are talking about the deformity you should be able to analyze that why this deformity is there. What is the reason for that deformity? That is a clinical you know knowledge you have to apply in your questionnaires. So you know that any deformity is defined by two words. The first word usually tells you the joint which is involved. So for this typical case elbow what is a word to be used? We know that it is cubitus. It is cubitus and when you say that the part of the limb part of the limb distal to the joint it goes medially part of the limb distal to the joint goes medially what do you call it it is known as cubitus varus it is known as cubitus varus and when the part of the limb distal to the joint goes laterally then we are going to call it valgus so if the forearm goes laterally it will be valgus varus is when it is going medially where do you see this varus so guys remember this varus is usually seen in a mal united fracture supracondylar humerus. This is seen in malunited fracture supracondylar humerus. Okay and this why this fracture supracondylar goes into malunion the logic of that you always have to keep your concepts clear. Supracondylar is what part of the bone? Metaphyseal area. What kind of bone? Cancellous bone. So that has got a huge blood you know supply big potential for the union. Cancellous bone, soft bone, uh, lot of blood supply. So union is usually seen. So non-unions are like very very unlikely kind of thing. So that is the reason they always unite being the cancellous portion of the bone or I must say being the metaphyseal area. Cancellous or metaphyseal they usually unite. They usually unite. On the other hand if I talk about the other deformity okay if I talk about this cubitus valgus where the forearm should have actually gone laterally you know that valgus will be seen after what kind of injury? Valgus will be seen after non-union. Valgus will be seen after the non-union of fracture, non-union of fracture lateral condyle of humerus. It will be seen with fracture, the non-union of fracture lateral condyle of humerus. And why this lateral condyle goes into non-union? That is also one important thing to understand because their common extensor origin over here. It will not allow the bone to stay in position, reduced position reduction position and that's why it keeps on getting displaced right. So non-union of flexure lateral condyle of humerus that is the valgus deformity. So varus and valgus remember these these are important things. So question can be based in, on the images, questions may be based on theory, question may be based on the concept of non-union and malunion right. Next important point guys is about the eponyms is about the eponyms. This has been like a frequently asked question in different exams including your INI patterns. So eponyms of the fractures are very very important. So I'm just going to enumerate different fractures starting from upper limb, spine, lower limb. So how do we learn and remember all of them? So starting from the hand area, starting from the hand area, the most important ones we remember the boxes fracture. We know the fifth metacarpal neck fracture right fifth metacarpal neck fracture second is the first metacarpal base they are they are Bennett Bennett and Rolando where are they the first metacarpal base intraarticular injuries right Bennett and Rolando the hand injuries basically 
Number three, the fractures at distal end of radius. We know the Coley's and Smith. What are they? They are extra articular fracture distal end of radius. Then we have the Barton. Then we have the Barton's and Schoffer fracture. What is the difference from Coley's and Smith? That these are intra articular fracture distal end of radius. Intra articular fracture distal end of radius. So Barton and Schoffer. Okay. Number five. Number five is what you call Galaxy. What was Galaxy? Galaxy was fracture distal end of the distal. We can say the fracture distal radius at shaft basically. So distal radius, one third of radius. We are talking about shaft injuries. Then we have Montagia. Then we have Montagia fracture. What is that? That is proximal ulna. The shaft again. Proximal ulna. The shaft again. Right. We go a little above. The name fracture is Holston Lewis. What is that Holston Lewis? What was that Holston Lewis? It was fracture shaft of the humerus. Holston Lewis fracture shaft of the humerus. Then we have the vertebral injuries. In the vertebral injuries we know we have Jefferson fracture. Jefferson fracture is C1 injury. Second we have is Hangman's fracture. Hangman's was C2 injury. Then we have the then we have this whiplash which doesn't involve the vertebral body. So basically this is a soft tissue injury of the neck area of the neck area also known as sprained neck. Then we have the clay shoveler's injury. Clay shoveler was what? It was the injury to the spinous process. Which spinous process? The longest one usually. It can be C7 or it can be T1. It can be C7 or it can be T1. So clay shoveler spinous process injury. Then you have, then you have the next one which is known as the chance fracture. The chance fracture or the seat belt injury which is a compression fracture with a fracture through all the elements of the spine right which can be seen like at usually dorsal region. Okay then you go to the lower limb then we start from the lower limb the fractures which are named they start in the proximal femoral area we don't have a name but in the pelvic area yes we have the fractures like straddle fractures straddle is bilaterally both pubic rami it is bilaterally both pubic rami then you have number 14 where you call it open book fracture so what was that open book open book fracture was the pelvis opens entirely through the pubic rami okay number 15 is what you call as melgagne fracture what is that melgagne melgagne is anterior and posterior injury to same hemi pelvis to same hemi pelvis and number 16 bucket handle fracture bucket handle fracture so injury anterior to one hemi pelvis okay and and posterior to the other one posterior to the other one opposite contralateral kind of thing okay in the pelvic area then you go down then we go down in the femoral uh, in the femur bone proximal femur middle femur doesn't have anything like named but in the distal femur we we have something known as hofas fracture hofas is what hofas is fracture of femoral condyle in the coronal plane femoral condyle in coronal plane then you have number 18 proximal fibia uh, distibia proximal tibia fracture is known as bumpers fracture cars bumpers hitting the tibia so drippers fracture of lateral tibial plateau so lateral tibial plateau okay it is the bumpers fracture is fracture of the lateral tibial plateau number 19 going down to the tibia we have eponyms at the lower tibia lower tibial eponyms are one is pylons fracture second one is pots fracture one is cotton's fracture one is mesonew fracture mesonew fracture so pylons fracture what is pylons pylon is pylon is any intraarticular fracture of the ankle any intraarticular ankle fracture 
पॉट इज बाय मेल्यूलर फ्रैक्चर पॉट इज बाय मेल्यूलर फ्रैक्चर कॉटन इज ट्राई मेल्यूलर फ्रैक्चर मीडियल मेल्यूलाय लैटल मेल्यूलाय एंड द पोस्टर मेल्यूलाय एंड वट इज मेजोनी मेजोनी वेज एंकल फ्रैक्चर विद प्रोक्सिमल फिबुला इंजरी विद प्रोक्सिमल फिबुला फ्रैक्चर ओके नंबर ट्वेंटी फोर इज अ टैलर इंजरीज टैलर हैज गॉट एपोनेम्स फॉर एग्जाम्पल एविएटर्स फ्रैक्चर द नेक ऑफ टैलस करेक्ट ट्वेंटी फाइव वी कैन लर्न द शेफर्ड फ्रैक्चर पोस्टर प्रोसेस ऑफ टैलस एंड नंबर ट्वेंटी सिक्स आई कैन मैंशन हेयर स्नोबोर्ड फ्रैक्चर दैट इज लैटरल प्रोसेस ऑफ टैलस सो दीज आर ऑल थ्रू टैलस एंड देन वी हैव ट्वेंटी सेवेंथ लाइक लेस फ्रैंक इंजरीज दैट इज इंटरटार्सल इंजरीज इंटरटार्सल फ्रैक्चर देन वी हैव चौपार्ट फ्रैक्चर दैट इज टार्सो दिस इंटरटार्सल एरिया द टार्सो मेटाटार्सल एरिया टी एम टी रीजन ओके टार्सल्स एंड द मेटाटार्सल एरियाज एंड द इंटरटार्सल एरिया द चौपार्ट एंड लेस फ्रैंक एंड देन वी हैव वन जोन्स फ्रैक्चर विच इज एट द बेस ऑफ फिफ्थ मेटाटार्सल ओके सो दीज आर ऑल द एपोनेम्स आउट ऑफ विच आई मस्ट रिमाइंड यू दैट दिस सेक्शन हैज बीन देयर ऑलरेडी आस्ट इन योर आई एन आई एग्जाम ओके सो दीज आर डिफरेंट एपोनेम्स सो यू मस्ट बी हैविंग दिस ब्रॉड आइडिया डोंट मार्क देम रॉन्ग इफ दे आर आस्ट इन एग्जाम ओके देन वी हैव द स्कोलियोसिस टॉपिक विच इज अगेन वेरी वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट टॉपिक फ्रॉम एग्जाम पॉइंट ऑफ व्यू इन स्कोलियोसिस यू नो द कॉजेज फॉर स्कोलियोसिस कैन बी सिंपल इट कैन बी कंजनाइटल और इट कैन बी इडियोपैथिक वेन यू आर टॉकिंग अबाउट कंजनाइटल स्कोलियोसिस नो it is either failure of formation of the bone that is failure of formation of the bone or it is failure of differentiation of the bones so that means two bones have failed to separate failure of formation simply means either it is a wedge vertebra or it is a hemi vertebra wedge vertebra or a hemi vertebra that means vertebra is not formed okay so all the time remember that they may give you one x-ray of the hemi vertebra wedge vertebra and then they ask you that what is the reason for scoliosis in this patient failure of differentiation means it is a block vertebra failure of differentiation means when it is a block vertebra it is a block vertebra so wedge or hemi vertebra okay so failure of formation failure of differentiation this is very very important whenever you want to see the angle of scoliosis the angle known here is known as cobb's angle it is known as cobb's angle okay and the treatment plan for the scoliotic patients the treatment plan for scoliotic patient in the children's we use the brace what is known as milwaukee the brace used in the child is known as milwaukee brace and in the adult the brace can be a reserve cast it can be a boston brace anything so milwaukee and reserve this can be the uh, potential area the question the scoliosis okay next we have supracondylar humerus actually it's a very 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 important topic you know supracondylar humeral injuries basically you know majority of the injuries will be like of this type 98% are of this type why because this is a extension kind of injury because this is a extension kind of injury right flexion kind of injuries are very very less uncommon ones and the most commonest displacement we see with supracondylar injury is posteromedial followed by postulateral injuries so you can see this is ulna this is radius and the distal part here is going little towards radius but usually it is coming towards medial displacement supracondylars are important in the view that you know the complication part is very very important so you must remember that the most commonest nerve involved number 1 in supracondylar is entrainotosseous nerve followed by median followed by radial followed by ulna so overall it is the ain which is most commonly involved second when you talk about the vessels it is a brachial artery which is most commonly involved uh, in the injuries of supracondylars then yes compartment syndrome is one of the most lethal complication which basically finally damages the muscles permanently walkman systemic contracture and the most common complication we must say of the supracondylar is malunion being a cancellous area the very first point i discussed with you right and this malunion leads to what kind of deformity cubitus varus and one complication which can happen after any sort of injury around the elbow is myositis ossificans is myositis ossificans okay so ain median radial ulna these points you must must remember the classification system which is used for supracondylars it is known as gartland's classification it is known as gartland's classification okay that is supracondylar 
Next point which I wanted to discuss was about the fracture's distal end of radius. The fracture distal end of radius, we know that these distal end of radius injuries are of two types. They can be extra articular, they can be extra articular or they can be intra articular. So extra articular injuries you know that they are either Coley's or Smith. Intra articular injuries they are Barton and Schoffer. So Coley's and Smith how do we differentiate? So this is the thumb and here the distal fragment basically is going on the back side. Right dorsally. So displacement of the Coley's you must remember that displacements are like 6 in number L I D S. L here stands for lateral displacement and lateral tilt. I here stands for impaction. D will be your dorsal displacement and dorsal tilt and S is for supination. So these are the six displacements and whenever instead of going dorsally the fragment goes on the palmer side we call it what the Smith injury right. So coolies have got these displacements. The you know uh, these areas being very cancellous very soft areas highly vascular areas they usually unite and therefore the complication related to them is usually malunion and this malunion you all know that it is going to produce a dinner fork in coles and the garden spade garden spade in the smith injuries and these deformities are because of the palmer or the dorsal displacement of the fragment here the fragment is coming back so it creates a hump over here the displacement here creates a hump over here and on the palmer side when it comes it creates a depression like that that is what you call garden spade so getting an elevation or a depression it is all because of the fragment coming palmerly or dorsally right treatment plan here is always conservative and the first step that you are going to do is always a traction and then after you apply the plaster in palmer flexion and ulnar deviation of the wrist area right so palmer flexion and ulnar deviation like that that's what you have called as the shake hand position or the handshake position we call it right this is the Barton and Schoffer they are intra-articular injuries and most often they will require a surgery or surgical fixation being intra-articular then this image is again very very important which you must always remember guys a infected foci inside is what you are going to call as the sequestrum is what you are going to call as sequestrum and this all whiteness all whiteness all around is what you call as is what you call as the involucrum in volucrum so sequestrum and in volucrum this all is the granulation tissue this all is the granulation tissue inside this all is the granulation tissue inside and from wherever you know this granulation tissue will go out is known as what the cloaca this has been an old question like four or five years back in your aims only and you must be able to differentiate between the sequestrum and the involucrum so what exactly is involucrum involucrum should be your reactionary new bone formation it has to be a reactionary new bone formation so don't mark it wrong this has been like when it was asked last time almost five years back you know uh, students were a little confused that was there involucrum marked or the sequestrum marked so be very very clear about the thought process this infected focus has to be sequestrum and this whiteness all around has to be your involucrum this whiteness okay and the rupture of this involucrum is your cloaca so keep this point very clear in your mind right keep this point very clear this all you see here this is a margin of ulna you all can appreciate and this is all periosteal elevation the sub periosteal abscess getting collected over here okay next what do i have for you is a tumor so all the time guys i have always always said when you are about to solve a tumor you have to follow the same sequence that means you have to first see the location of the lesion don't ever go and try to see the special feature what it is showing you location is the most important thing so location try to figure out the nature of the lesion and then try to see if there is any special feature. Looking at this particular image, you can see location here is epiphysin. Location here is epiphysis. Right? Looking at the nature of the lesion here, this side, the lateral side, seems to be all right. Cortex is okay. Seems to be benign. Look, going for the medial side, you can see that the medial margin, the cortex is broken. The cortex is broken. So nature here is not very benign not very aggressive it is locally aggressive so what do you call it the benign aggressive lesion epiphyseal benign aggressive lesion what is that showing you some special feature what these septations are known as the soap bubble okay so these three points make this tumor goes as gct the other name for which we already know is osteoclastoma 
So what I'm trying to say guys is that if a tumor has been given to you, never ever try to change the sequence. Don't say it is soap bubble, so it is GCT. No, say that it is epiphyseal, margin is broken. It seems like it is, a lo it is showing local aggressions. Locally, it is destroying the bone. Therefore, and showing soap bubble. Therefore, I say it is giant cell tumor. Okay, the sequence has to be same. Don't try to break the sequence, right? That will be a little difficult for us. Sometimes even the answer can be wrong. Okay, so always follow this sequence when you're trying to solve any questionnaire on the bone tumors. Let's see the next one. Next one is somewhat like this. So again, follow the thing that we have just discussed. Just try to see the location here. Again, the location here. So location here, epiphysis is clean, metaphysal area, sunburst appearance, you can see that. So location, nature, it is showing you a lot of periosteal response and special feature is sunburst. So metaphysal area which is aggressive and showing sunburst is only one tumor that is your osteosarcoma. So guys that would be the way to reach out to any any you know uh, I must say diagnosis in any of the questionnaires. So always follow this. Then this one if you see the lateral view of the same picture it will be your this elevation of the periosteum that is your sunburst appearance on this one and this is what you have called as the Cordman's triangle. That is known as the Cordman's triangle, right? That would be Cordman's triangle. And coming on to this one, the last one which I wanted to take up is about the splint support, right? What is about the splint support? Here, the knuckle bender, bending the knuckles, elevating the wrist is cock up. Now, guys, looking at this, in this only, I would like to add up a few things here. I would like to add up a few things here. See, knuckle bender and cock up, I don't think you'll find much, much of a difficulty here, much of the difficulty here to find them out, okay? One important point about after the splint support that I want to actually take up is about when they ask you about uh, these skeletal tractions. These are splint supports and one point should be about the skeletal tractions which should be very very clear to us. So guys after like this knuckle bender or the cock up one thing I wanted to discuss with you is about the traction systems in orthopedics. Like this is one of the important areas and we have seen that in last couple of years this has been a frequently asked question. Tractions, see, the tractions, uh, especially, I am talking about the skeletal tractions. What all appliances can be used to give skeletal traction? We know, number one, for smaller bones, we can have K wires, phalangeal area, metacarpal area. And for the bigger bones, we have two major pins to be used. One is known as Tenman spins and other is known as the Denim spin. One is Stenman and other is Denim's. I do believe you have the idea about this. If you don't have the idea, please do download the files of splints and tractions and the instrument and implants from the Telegram group. Okay, They are over there on the DBMC Premier group as well as my own group, Telegram group. They are already there. Just download the file and keep it safe with you. See, skeletal traction, the pins to be used are these. And then this traction system, the pin has to be basically fixed with something known as the bowler's stirrup. Bowler's stirrup and what is that bowler's stirrup? It is an appliance which will keep your pin fixed like this is your pin let's suppose this is the pin okay this is the pin fixed here so this bowler's stirrup basically it will be giving you a space where you can actually where you can put the weight and now through this weight you can maintain the traction that's a bowler's stirrup okay so K wire, Stenman pin, Denim spin and bowler's stirrup required and then you can have a bed pulley Basically, the function of the pulley will be smooth this transition of this rope so that rope doesn't get stuck anywhere. So, these are all required to put a skeletal traction. Skeletal, other than skeletal traction, the other concept will be of the external fixation. So, please remember the different types of external fixators which are available with us. Number one is the most stable one is what you call Elizaro. It is Elizaro fixator. Second one is what we use most commonly in our orthopedic OTs rods and clamps these rods and clamps they can be applied in a uniplanar these can be applied as uniplanar single rod they can be applied as uniplanar dual rod okay they can be applied as multiplanar or they can be applied as like with the other kind of fixators which are known as the rail fixator which is also known as the lrs which stands for the limb reconstruction system LRS and fourth one is an Indian external fixator we have is known as JIS that is Joshi external stabilization system 
guys you must have a profound knowledge of all these pins appliances external fixator systems because you know this has been asked quite a number of times in your previous years you must have the idea about that so as i said the file name will be splint and traction splint and traction and instrument and implant instrument and implant so please download it from your telegram groups okay so the important uh, you know concepts that i wanted to highlight through these 10 questionnaires was the approach to the bone tumors approach to the infections approach to the metabolic disorders the basic concept should be there in your mind how do i diagnose a infection how do I diagnose any swelling which can be infection, which can be a collection, which can be a arthropathy, crystal arthropathy, anything. So any swelling anywhere will be best diagnosed by take out that swelling and send it for clinical microscopical evaluation, not clinical, microscopic evaluation. Maybe for acid fast bacilli, maybe for crystal examination, maybe for the, uh, uh, the sculpture and sensitivity. So all the time, you know, basic approach has to be very, very clear when you are talking about any of the uh, these swellings or collection anywhere so the guys this was the basic approach uh, i do believe your preparation is already going on the right track in case you want my assistance for something do let me know i'll be more than glad to help you out for anything i can okay so i am very much approachable on the telegram groups on the social media just tag me over there and uh, in case any other academic assistance is also required i'll be like more than happy to do that okay so just have your focus very very clear just aim should be very very clear have faith in your preparation have faith in your destiny and i am very much sure that you are going to go through okay so my bestest wishes to all of you guys keep preparing well have confidence all the very best